I'm always delighted to get to be with you folks. For those that haven't met before, my name is Tom Hoyle with Bible and Science Ministries. And since 1985, our full-time work has dealt with a wonderful accuracy of God's Word, especially in terms of history and archaeology and science. We believe, as I know most of you do, as I know pastor preaches and teaches, the deeper we dig, the better God's Word looks. So anyway, at least before COVID and hopefully after COVID, Ordinarily, during the week, I'm in public schools, Christian schools, homeschool groups, Awanas, youth rallies, colleges, and that kind of thing. And of course, on Sundays, we get to be with God's folks like yours, and we can't thank you enough for your interest and friendship and support, without which we wouldn't have a ministry the rest of the time. Anyway, today we get to share with you uh, 10 excellent reasons to trust in God. We shared this program with you a long, long time ago, but we've added a lot to it and updated it, and we hope that it will be a blessing to you. We're always happy to take your questions and comments, either after the program or over here, if you like, uh, during uh, our own time together. Uh, furthermore, I've had a lot of questions about the books and discs, so let me say a quick word about those so people don't get the wrong thing for the wrong reason, which would be very easy to do. As you may recall, we do bring the books and discs for two main reasons. Number one, many of these are extremely hard to get. In fact, some of them are out of print. And number two, we do discount them, sometimes dramatically, because I'm able to buy them in very large quantities and get better discounts as a result. Some of these we mentioned before, uh, some of them are new. Is Genesis History is my favorite book on Christian, or DVD, on Christian apologetics. It's an hour and a half long, but it's broken up into segments. Genesis and archaeology, Genesis and astronomy, Genesis and biology. You get the idea. And then, gorgeous, gorgeous DVD, beautiful music called Dismantled. Great for witnessing. It's all about the scientific evidences as why we think creation by God makes much more sense than evolution by chance. A closer look at the evidence is a gorgeous, full-color devotional guide. One page per day is all we ask. Each page has uh, a scripture to read, of course, as well as an article and photographs with regard to evidences for God's Word. I might add, um, I know the man who's behind the publication of this, and he did warn me he's got no choice but to raise his prices. So if you are interested, it'd be good to go ahead and get this because it'll go up at least $2 this summer. And the same thing is true, unfortunately, my, for my favorite family book, Wonders of Creation, and its partner book, Evidence for the Bible. These are going up by 10% this summer as is uh, a number of the titles. I'm just warning you because sometimes people like me to tell them what the scoop is. My favorite book on dinosaurs is this one, and our best-selling book is God's book, big book of animals. They, too, are going up about 10% this summer. Hey, so much for all that. I don't want to waste any more time on commercials. Thank you for coming. Thank you for su your support. Let's go ahead and get started here today, and let me get out of your way here. Oh, my optical blocking device has been activated. Yes, but foolproof. <laughs> and requires no batteries. All righty. As you might recall, a while back, we talked about my favorite program. We talked about Genesis, the moon, and NASA's boldest journey. As you might recall, during the flight of Apollo 8, they honored God like no other space flight ever. For one thing, they read the story of creation from Genesis chapter 1 in lunar orbit for a billion people to hear on Earth. One of my favorite books on this subject is by Robert Zimmerman, who said, Russian cosmonaut Yuri, Yuri Gagarin, he proclaimed he saw no God in space. U.S. astronauts Borman, Lovell, and Anders saw him everywhere and said so. No wonder, for this reason and many, many others, we can understand why God tells us the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. This morning, let's look at 10 excellent reasons, not proofs, but reasons to trust in God's existence, starting with answered prayer. As you know from Scripture, as pastors, I'm sure he's preached, Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be given unto you. 
As you might recall from our programs on God in America, folks, our country is certainly not perfect by a long shot, is it? But God's been using his country in spite of itself, right? And it is exciting to see God in action throughout 500 years of American prayer power. For right now, may we note, let's go back in time to the Second World War. Europe, winter of 1944. It was his last major gamble, the last major campaign of World War II. Adolf Hitler launched the famous Ardennes campaign just before Christmas. Better known as, that's right, the Battle of the Bulge. The longest, bloodiest, and most desperate battle in American military history. The key to victory for this battle, which is pivotal, would be whoever controlled the small Belgian town of Bastogne. The Americans held it, but they outnumbered three to one. The Americans were desperately short on everything. It's called the four Bs. They were short on bullets, blankets, bandages, and beans. But the weather was awful. The C-47s could not get any support into Bastogne and help relieve, in particular, the 101st Airborne Division. The film Band of Brothers is actually uh, pretty good about that desperate time. Well, enter a general named George. George S. Patton, of course, had some significant problems, but folks, there are three things about him I like a lot. George S. Patton prayed on his knees at least once a day, every single day. George S. Patton read his Bible at least once a day, every single day. I've seen a copy of his favorite Bible at the U.S. Army's Armored Museum in Kentucky, and it's full of notes and outlines. But folks, George S. Patton wanted as many pastors for his troops in the U.S. Third Army as he could get. George S. Patton had 486 chaplains, twice as much as any other army of similar size. Well, Patton volunteered to do the impossible. He was going to pivot a quarter of a million men and women and make a non-stop dash for three days straight without stopping through ice and snow, the horrible weather, and the enemy to reach Bastogne in time to save the 101st Airborne Division, to lift the siege. And to do that, he decided it was time for some prayer power. He told his chief chaplain that he wanted a weather prayer. Make a long story short, Chaplain James O'Neill wrote a weather prayer for Patton. They decided to put it on a card, and on the back of the card, they would have a Christmas greeting from Patton. This became known as the Patton Prayer Card. Patton said, I want every single person in my army to get one of these, a quarter of a million people. I want everybody to pray, pray, pray for good weather so we can reach Bastogne in time. On top of that, though, Past a patent, he issued training letter number five to 3,100 of his officers and senior non-commissioned officers, NCOs. In this training letter, he is telling these officers how to pray and how to get their men to pray. As you can see, he said, we must urge, instruct, and indoctrinate every fighting man to what? Pray as well as fight. Spiritually alert minorities carry the burdens and bring the victories. One biographer said, Patton saw prayer as a force, a force of God, really, not just some words one uttered. Patton had his men praying. Patton had people back home praying. Patton asked God specifically for four straight days of clear weather so his army could reach Bastogne. It worked so well, later on, he wished he'd asked God for six days. But at any rate, the day after the patent prayer cards were finally distributed, the weather cleared for the first time. It stopped snowing. The roads started drying up. And Patton got four clear days of weather. I held my breath, folks. I checked U.S. Army weather records for the Battle of Bulge. The only four straight, clear days of weather were the days that Patton prayed for. 
The U.S. 3rd Army, led by the 4th Armored Division, reached Bastogne just in time on the day after Christmas, 1944. Patton's public affairs officer, a Lieutenant Colonel Jack Widmer said, thousands of 3rd Army men believe the Lord worked a true modern miracle in answer to General Patton's prayer for aid to turn the tide at the Battle of the Bulge. But folks, it goes a lot beyond that. For example, the most popular book I've ever read on the Battle of the Bulge has an entire prayer on Patton's prayer. I mean, page on Patton's prayer. The Weather Channel has a very interesting series called The 100 Biggest Weather Moments in History. One of those episodes is called A Prayer for Good Weather, Patton's Prayer. It's nominated by U.S. four-star Army General Wesley Clark. I almost fell out of my chair when during the program, Wesley Clark read Patton's prayer and said that most people think this prayer is what turned the tide of the Battle of the Bulge. The Los Angeles Times, a very, very secular newspaper, several years ago had a feature article about the Battle of the Bulge, and it focused on Patton's prayer. In the article, it said, his prayer was answered, the weather miraculously cleared, and Patton broke through the German defenses and relieved Bastogne. We could go on and on, folks. But you know what? Next time you come across somebody who thinks that only wusses and, wiss and sissies are Christians, you might say, hey, you should start to pray. Pray like Patton. <laughs> Truly, call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. By the way, folks, this was a member of Patton's 3rd U.S. Army, Private First Class R.G. Hopper. Now, I would be amazed if anybody here had ever heard of R.G. He was a young Private First Class. He was a member of an anti-aircraft battalion in Patton's Army, and Patton later turned it into an anti-tank unit instead. He saw heavy fighting from June 1944 through May of 1945. He's smiling here because the war is now over. He's still alive. His best friend was brutally killed right next to him during savage street fighting for St. Lowe's shortly after D-Day. I'm glad that RJ, uh, RG survived for several reasons. I mean, one for his sake. And another reason, folks, a few years later, after World War II, RG got married. He started a family. He had a little girl named Penny who'd become my wife. But moving on, folks, a lot more examples could be afforded regarding answered prayer, right? But let's move on for the sake of time, for another great reason, trust in God's existence, besides many, many examples of answered prayer, providential history. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. There are many, many examples of God in action throughout world history. For right now, may we mention something about the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel, as you might know, has been in an almost constant state of war since 1948, when it was miraculously resurrected from the dead after almost 2,000 years. But even to this day, Israel has to look out for itself. In neighboring kibbutzes that I have visited, it is not unusual to see Israeli teenage girls going to school carrying AK-47s and M16 rifles. There is one plus side to this. Teenage boys in Israel are very polite to teenage girls in Israel. <laughs> well, folks, Israel fought five major wars during all this time, and by far the most desperate of all these wars, the war that basically saved their nation the most was the 1973 October or Yom Kippur War. In retaliation for previous dramatic defeats, the Egyptians and Syrians launched a massive one-two punch by surprise against Israel's defense uh, force. The attacks were incredibly successful. Israel was reeling from the impact. They lost thousands of troops, hundreds of armored vehicles, and dozens of combat aircraft. Things were looking very, very, very bad. 
Golda Meir went to the UN and begged them to do something. She said, we cannot hold our lines. We will be overrun. There will be another Holocaust. Israel, and this is documented, Israel was so desperate, they began the countdown for what's called the Samson option. They loaded a dozen thermonuclear warheads aboard F-4 and A-4 fighter bombers and Jericho medium-range ballistic missiles. If the enemy breached their lines, they were going to nuke Egypt and Syria. Well, folks, God stepped in big time using a nation, namely America. America was the only country in the world that stood up for Israel during this very, very desperate time. The United States, big long story, began Operation Nickel Grass. Never in history has a country sent so much, so far, so fast to help another nation. I could tell you some interesting stories. It was mainly an American Air Force massive airlift. And it worked. The Israelis were rearmed with everything they needed, and they were able, against all odds, outnumbered 60 to 1, they pushed back both of the enemy forces. So the bottom line, folks, if you want a good reason for believing in God's existence, all you got to do is look at the nation of Israel. Somebody's been looking out for this country, folks, and that during the Yom Kippur War, that somebody used our country to do it. Benjamin Franklin, not a Christian, but I don't think he was a very good deist either. A deist back then was somebody who believed in God, but God apparently just made everything and walked away. Benjamin Franklin did not believe that at all. He was huge on American prayer power, for one thing. You might recall he's the one that urged Congress to always open in prayer every session. Benjamin Franklin said, among other things, God governs in the nations of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that a nation can rise without his aid? Truly, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. But next, regrettably, got to keep moving on, a third excellent reason from, for trusting in God's existence, besides answered prayer, besides dramatic interventions in history, we turn to purpose for life. How many here folks have been a little bit bummed the last couple years? Okay, some of us, all right. <laughs> it's been rough, hasn't it? And indeed, even before COVID, folks, Americans overall were so downed, two tons of stimulants were being prescribed and consumed during this time. The so suicide rate, of course, during COVID skyrocketed as well as prescriptions. The number one reason given by people, especially during this time, for committing suicide, I have no reason to live. Well, I'm afraid our atheist friends had no help to offer for that. Bertrand Russell is probably the most famous atheist philosopher of all time. He wrote a very famous book, Why I Am Not a Christian. But in it, I read that he admitted without God, there'd be no reason to live because life would be nothing but confident despair. <laughs> That's pretty sad, isn't it? Well, America's greatest natural scientist was Louis Agassiz, and he warns, without God, there would be nothing but despair. He was a staunch born-again Christian. And he, along with countless others, have realized we have a reason to live. We have a purpose for living, because for me to live is Christ, as the Apostle Paul said, right? I'm not a huge fan, but Rick Warren, his famous book, The Purpose Driven Life, it became an international bestseller, because why? He was reminding people there is a reason to live, correct? There is a purpose for life, starting with accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. As you might recall, my favorite American, believe it or not, George Washington Carver. And he told Congress, the secret of my success, it is simple. It is found in the Bible. In all thy ways acknowledge him, the Lord Jesus Christ, creator and savior, 
and he shall direct thy paths. He was telling them, I live for Christ. Or, very famous physicist, James Clerk Maxwell, Albert Einstein gave him the credit for most of his own scientific discoveries. Maxwell said, as you can see, I believe ad infinitum that man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. We could go on and on what other great men and women have said about this, but we go back to scripture, folks, and we know once more, after accepting Christ as Savior, we have a reason or purpose for living, and we're to press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Next reason. I'm squeaking up here a lot. Sorry about that. <laughs> anyway, folks, our fourth great reason for believing in God, the personal testimonies of those who have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, his son, as Savior. The Bible talks about the fact, indeed, that there's a cloud of witnesses that testify regarding me. May I share with you some of my favorite scientists, hard-nosed analytical individuals, and what they had to say. Case in point, William Thompson, also known as Lord Kelvin, he's England's second most famous physicist, folks, after Sir Isaac Newton. He said, if you think strongly enough, You'll be forced by science to believe in God. Or, I'm a fan of his, just finished reading a big biography, Michael Faraday, you talk about rags to riches. This man started out very, very low in life and became the world's most famous electrical engineer, the founder of electrical engineering. He said, thank God first for all his gifts. Or, the father of physical uh, chemistry was a good Irishman named Sir Robert Boyle. Not Hoyle, he almost got his name right. He said, from a knowledge of his work, we shall know him. Or the founder of entomology, Henry Faber. He said, without him, the Lord Jesus Christ, I understand nothing. Without him, all this darkness. You can take my skin from me more easily than my faith in God. Isn't that a thought? Or could we say a word about famous Americans, especially leaders and what they thought? George Washington, uh, I'm sorry, about to say Carver. George Washington, you might recall George Washington Carver named himself, folks, okay, after George Washington. At any rate, Washington said, it is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. Very politically incorrect, don't you think? Or James Madison, father of the U.S. Constitution. He said, the belief in a God all-powerful, wise, and good is so essential to the moral order of the world and to the happiness of man. Or I'm from Tacoma in Pierce County, named after Franklin Pierce. Franklin Pierce said, there is no national security, but the nation's humble, acknowledged dependence upon God. Dwight D. Eisenhower, five-star general, president. Without God, he said, there would be no American form of government, nor an American way of life. No wonder, folks, in God we trust has been an unofficial national motto since 1814, and by 1865, it was unofficially on all of our coins. And folks, in 1956, it was officially made the law of the land. Our national model is indeed in God we trust. Well, next, we turn to cosmology. Cosmology. How did everything get here, folks? According to God's word, we're reminded, for every house is built by some man. But he that built all things is God. Here we have, of course, Mount Vernon. If I told you Mount Vernon was a result of piles of lumber and metal and wire and glass and mortar and what have you, and then through tectonic activity, all the components for this building were jumbled together and accidentally assembled, making Mount Vernon. You'd say that was stupid, wouldn't you? Obviously, somebody designed Mount Vernon and somebody built Mount Vernon, right? 
But the universe is a lot more complicated than Mount Vernon, isn't it? If somebody designed and made Mount Vernon, somebody designed and made the universe. So regarding cosmology, may we first of all look at the origin of the universe, and then secondly, the origin of life. Regarding the origin of the universe, Albert Einstein, not a Christian, but folks, he certainly wasn't an atheist either. As you might recall, he's famous for having said, God does not play dice with the cosmos. He also said, as you might recall, his goal in his career was to know what was in God's mind. Everything else are details. And by the way, many of our astronauts that have gone up there to study Einstein's universe have concluded that there is definitely a God. Well, I'm a hero. I'm sorry, he's a hero to me, John Glenn. And among many other things, John Glenn said, to look out at this kind of creation and not believe in God is to me impossible. It just strengthens my faith. Or the man most responsible for getting our astronauts up there in the first place was the father of the modern American Day Space Program, Werner von Braun. Werner von Braun, among many, 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 many other things, he said, the better we understand the intricacies of the universe, the more reason we have found to marvel at the inherent design upon which it is based. So much more can be said. But Psalm 19.1 says it best, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. But we turn from the origin of the universe to the origin of life, which is a huge evolutionary problem. Two of my college debates were canceled by my opponents at the last minute. They said the debates were traps and they were afraid to bring up the origin of life. They were right. I was. <laughs> Folks, I miss these little guys. How many miss these little guys you can stick in your pocket? All right. So these great big clunky phones, right? I miss cell phones. If I told you that cell phone, the components gathered themselves, assembled themselves, and then made a cell phone, you'd say that was absurd. A single cell of life is far more complicated than a cell phone is. If somebody made that cell phone, somebody made those cells of life. It's only logical, isn't it? In fact, even our evolutionary friends admit that folks, a single cell of life is about as simple as New York City. <laughs> New York City didn't just happen, did it? And life didn't either, did it? As you might recall from our human body program, the human body, folks, has over a hundred trillion cells in it. Wow, folks, that's big, of 250 different types. And folks, how many of those cells have we been able to make? Anybody? Zero. You've got a very bad attitude, but you're right. Zero. Zip. Zilch. Nada. No matter how hard we've tried with all of our computers and all of our equipment, we've been unable to make one single cell in the laboratory. Folks, that tells me if you can't make one on purpose, it didn't evolve by accident, did it? Which brings me to my favorite evolutionary scientist, man with an excellent last name, Sir Frederick Hoyle. Many of you remember this, but I'd like to bring it up from time to time to remind us, and maybe some haven't heard about this. Sir Frederick Hoyle, extremely famous astrophysicist, mathematician, and all-around genius, he admitted the chances of life evolving by accident are about the same as the chances of a tornado in a junkyard assembling a 747. That is not going to happen, is it? By the way, one time I was sharing this story with some Auburn engineers. I was doing a devotional for them. They were offended that I would imply that their wonderful airplane, which you folks know very well here, don't you? How many have been to the, the Boeing uh, 747 tour? Isn't that, isn't that great? They take you through seven different steps so you can build your own 747. Anyway, folks, I remember one time I went on that tour and uh, Air Force One was in a hangar being painted. And I asked the tour guide on the bus, I said, is that Air Force One? And he goes, oh, we're not supposed to say. <laughs> I think they should have kept the doors closed, don't you? 
It was really hard to miss. Anyway, folks, anyway. They were offended, I would imply, their airplane happened by accident. However, folks, a single simple cell is more complex than a 747. That's right, you guessed it. If somebody made the 747, somebody made the first single simple cell and all the other cells after that, right? Hoyle's research wound up on the front page of this London newspaper, the headlines reading, two skeptical scientists put their heads together and reached an amazing conclusion. There must be a God. Well, do tell. We could, again, go on and on, but we know in Scripture, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Next, again, for the sake of time, we turn to another reason for trusting in God's existence, the conscience. The conscience has sometimes been called our moral compass or our moral GPS. The famous philosopher Polybius said, there is no witness so terrible, no accuser so potent as the conscience that dwells in every man's breast. Thomas Jefferson, again, folks, don't think he was a Christian, but he wasn't a very good deist either because he did believe in a very, very active providential God. He did believe in prayer. Thomas Jefferson commented, the moral sense or conscience is as much a part of man as his leg or arm. Or John Adams, considered the father of, the American, of American independence, he said the most abandoned scoundrel that ever existed never yet wholly extinguished his conscience. Or, uh, if you've never read Peace Child by Don Richardson, to me it's must reading. It's a fascinating mission story. And one of the things that jumps out at you, he, no matter where he went, no matter who he talked to among these savage, savage people, every single one of them still had a conscience that he could reach with the gospel. The origin of the conscience is a serious, serious problem for atheists. B.F. Skinner from the, uh, the um, Behavioral School of Psychology and Sigmund Freud from the Psychoanalytical School of Psychology, Nurture and Nature, neither one was able to come up with a good theory to explain the evolutionary origin of the conscience. Folks, God's responsible for our conscience, isn't he? Or here we have Madeline Murray O'Hare. Um, as some of you know, I had the opportunity, if you want to call it that, to uh, meet her and debate her briefly at the Shrine Mosque in Springfield, Missouri. And folks, one of the questions I asked her was, how do you explain the origin of the conscience? And of course, she didn't have a good ex explanation at all. But for right now, we know, back in God's Word, and herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Uh, you might remember Billy Graham wrote a book, and it was just simply entitled Peace with God. It's nice to have peace with God, isn't it? But next, we turn to God's Word as an evidence, as a reason to trust in God's existence. Wow. The Bible... God's Word has been the number one best-selling book every single year, non-stop, for over 500 years straight. We're talking about 6 billion copies total, 1 billion of those, the King James Bible. If you add the New Testaments and the Gospels of John, the figure rises to 20 billion. The only close competitor to the Bible for circulation is Mao C. Tung's Little Red Book. 900 million of those have been printed. They've not even reached the billion mark yet. And keep in mind, folks, Mao C. Tung's Little Red Book is not really a fair example. You know why? Because the publication was forced. It was required. At any rate, we can see why God's Word's been so popular, because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. As you might know in other programs, we talk about all sorts of awesome reasons for trusting in God's Word. 
As far as what other people think about it, Sir Isaac Newton, greatest scientist who's ever lived, he said, I have a fundamental belief in the Bible as a word of God, written by men who were inspired. I study the Bible. Can all of us say the same thing? Study the Bible daily? Or England's most famous astronomer, Sir, Sir William Herschel, he admitted, all human discoveries seem to be made only for the purpose of confirming more and more strongly the truth contained in the Holy Scriptures. He maintained true science always agreed with the Bible. It's not science versus the Bible, is it? It might be evolution versus the Bible or evolution versus science. But again, God's word and God's world point to him, don't they? The father of electrical engineering was Ambrose Fleming who said, there's abundant evidence that the Bible, though written by men, is not the product of the human mind by countless multitudes. It has always been revered as a communication to us from the creator of the universe. Or, that's right, back to George Washington Carver. And by the way, folks, if you might recall, Carver did not invent peanut butter. He reinvented it though, because before he came along, peanut butter spoiled very, very quickly. Among his many, many, many discoveries, he decided to homogenize peanut butter, mix it all up, and as a result, as you might know, peanut butter pretty much lasts forever now, doesn't it? Anyway, I digress. George Washington Carver said, again to Congress, the Bible tells about the God who made the peanut. I asked him to show me what to do with the peanut, and he did. Abraham Lincoln, all things most desirable for man's welfare here and hereafter are to be found portrayed in the Bible. Or fast forward to Woodrow Wilson, wasn't perfect, but nobody is. During World War I, he said, I am sorry for the men who do not read the Bible every day. I wonder why they deprive themselves of the strength and of the pleasure. Or fast forward to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who said, we cannot read the history of our rise and development as a nation without reckoning with the place the Bible has occupied in shaping the advances of the Republic. Or, fast forward, 1983. Ronald Reagan declared 1983 as the year of the Bible. Truly, no wonder we can see why we are told in Scripture, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But next, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he definitely existed, which tells us the Fa Father of God, he existed too, didn't he? You might have heard the famous trilemma of Josh McDowell. Josh McDowell said, if Jesus Christ really did live, we've got a serious problem. Was he a liar? Was he a lunatic? Or was he obviously, most logically, Lord of all? Well, there really was a Jesus Christ. You might have heard of Flavius Josephus. Flavius Josephus was a non-Christian Jewish leader and historian who lived at the time of the Apostle Paul. Flavius Josephus, non-Christian, living almost 2,000 years ago in his famous Antiquities of the Jews, he tells us that there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he is a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth of pleasure. He drew over to him, made the Jews and made the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophet foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things about him. And the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct at this day. But Flavius Josephus is not the only one talking, is he? Many other people living up to 2,000 years ago refer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Cornelius Tacitus, Suetonius, Pliny the Younger, Lucian of Samosata, and others. On top of that, we have in the scriptures 330 predictions, prophecies involving the Lord Jesus Christ. He's already fulfilled most of them. 
There will be a few more left that he will take care of, care of when he comes again. Archaeology, time and time again, either directly or indirectly verifies the Lord Jesus Christ. And we could go on and on regarding the scriptures, couldn't we? Again, folks, if there was a Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, there was a Father God as well, wasn't there? Because the Bible tells us, according to Jesus, I and my Father are one. Persons of the Trinity, right? Back to Sir Isaac Newton, who said, we are to worship Jesus alone as the Lord, Messiah, the great King, the Lamb of God, who was slain and hath redeemed us with his blood and made us kings and priests. Isn't that pretty cool? Or, I thought this was a pretty good movie, actually. Emily Blunt played in the young Victoria, who said, England has become great and happy by the knowledge of the true God through Jesus Christ. He wasn't perfect, but Andrew Jackson said, the Bible is true. And upon that sacred volume, I rest my hope of eternal salvation through the merits of our blessed Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Or, my favorite president for all kinds of reasons, Theodore Roosevelt. He said, as president, I am enabled to hold up Christ as the hope and savior of the world. Now, is that politically incorrect? <laughs> I don't think it's too well known now. Maybe some of us old people remember this. There were a lot of greeting cards and that kind of thing with the incomparable Christ on it. It's a beautiful, beautiful sort of an essay or poem about the obvious existence of Jesus Christ and his impact upon the world. If you've never read that, I encourage you to go online. There are many, many uh, websites with the incomparable Christ. There was also a very popular poem called One Solitary Life. How many remember One Solitary Life? Anybody? That was on a lot of, of uh, greeting cards, too. And I think we should probably read this one, okay? It's not too long. He was born in, in a, I'm sorry, he was born in an obscure village. He worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. He then became an itinerant preacher. He never held an office. He never had a family or owned a house. He didn't go to college. He had no credentials but himself. Nineteen centuries have come and gone, and today he is a central figure of the human race. All the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, and all the kings that ever reigned have not affected the life of man on this earth as much as that one solitary life. Truly, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. But we now turn to the third person of the Trinity, besides God the Father, God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who definitely lived. We turn to God the Holy Spirit, or Holy Ghost. The Bible tells us, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. If you're a born-again Christian, you understand what we're talking about here. When we're born again, the Holy Spirit indwells us and fills us, doesn't he? And testifies regarding God the Father and God the Son. Blaise Pascal, very, very famous physicist, philosopher, and mathematician, was also a very, very devout born-again Christian. He's called the father of modern-day meteorology. He invented the barometer the chief weather forecasting instrument. He invented the altimeter aboard most aircraft. Blaise Pascal is the one, when referring to the Holy Ghost, he said there is a God-shaped vacuum in each of us until that vacuum is filled by the Holy Ghost that we receive after accepting Christ as Savior. By the way, he's also still considered to be the world's greatest expert on probability. And he made what's called Pascal's Wager. I used this one time on somebody in a hospital. We're great. You can find Pascal's Wager on all kinds of websites. Pascal, who was an expert on mathematics and probability, he said, How can anyone lose who chooses to become a Christian? If when he dies, it turns out to be no God, and his faith was in vain, he has lost, lost nothing. In fact, he has been happier in life than his non-believing friends. If, however, there is a God and a heaven and a hell, then he has gained heaven, and his skeptical friends will have lost everything in hell. 
Isn't that the truth? Truly, when he, the spirit of truth has come, uh, uh, spirit of truth has come, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, he will guide you unto all truth. Well, last but not least, and again, as you can imagine, so much more could be said, but some of you are thinking, let my people go. Folks, we now come to a tenth reason for trusting in God's existence, the recreation of man. One of my favorite evidences for creation by God versus evolution by chance concerns metamorphosis. Metamorphosis, for example, involving this beautiful swallowtail butter butterfly, other butterflies, moths, frogs. Metamorphosis, hard to explain for evolution. But what's even more amazing then this kind of metamorphosis is the spiritual metamorphosis that we experience when we become a born-again Christian, right? Because we're told, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Perhaps the most famous and dramatic example of a spiritual metamorphosis would be the Apostle Paul, right? When he was... Uh, very dramatically saved on the road to Damascus. May I share with you my personal favorite example of an amazing metamorphosis that's hard to explain every, any other way? His name was Cecil Richardson. Cecil Richardson was from the same state as my late mother, West Virginia. Cecil Richardson, though, was a hillbilly from the sticks. He was more of a hillbilly than the hillbillies were ever hillbillies on the famous TV show. Cecil Richardson was a violent man. He carried a gun. He got into fights all the time. He was a heavy drinker. But guess what? He said, you know what? I was tired of seeing the girls I was seeing. I decided I wanted to meet a nice, sweet girl. Now, where's the best place to find a nice, sweet girl, folks? Church! He heard there was a revival in town. And he said, I'll go to that revival and I'll get me a sweet girl. <laughs> he thought they charged admission to go to church. So he broke in a back door of the church and snuck in from that direction. He goes to the auditorium and he was stunned. It was already almost full, but the front row seats were empty. He thought, this is crazy. The front seats in a, any ball game or concert are first to be filled up. Must have been a Baptist church. <laughs> So he says, I sat in the front row. And apparently the preacher, I guess, absolutely clobbered him with the gospel. He said, I had to get saved. I didn't want to go to hell. I didn't want to live any more the way I was. And he's embarrassed about this. He wanted so desperately to get saved so fast, he actually knocked a lady out of the way so he could be the first one to go to the altar and pray. <laughs> he got saved, folks. Big time. Big, long story short, he went to college, went to graduate school. He became a senior officer in the U.S. Air Force. And he also became the Air Force's most famous soul winner. I had the privilege of serving under his command when I was in the Air Force Reserve for 35 years. I served under his command at McCord Air Force Base. Cecil Richardson, folks, now a lieutenant colonel, on his own time, he, first of all, started a Bible study for single airmen. And he built the Bible study from zero to 150 in a year and a half. And he led 100 of those men to the Lord. He would knock door to door uh, on the doors of the barracks, leading people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Cecil Richardson, this hick from, Hill, this hick from West Virginia, would eventually become a major general in the United States Air Force. And his favorite saying was, trust God. Folks, if God's Holy Spirit with the Lord Jesus Christ can save a man like that, that dramatically, there is a God. Truly, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Well, I wish we could go on and on, but some of you probably want to go and, and have lunch. At this time, we thank you so much for coming here. Can we have the lights, please? And we hope and pray two things. 
Number one, if there's anybody here who does not know what it means to be a Christian, to be saved, to go to heaven, to live eternally, please, please, please see one of us before you go. It's only the most important thing in life you will ever, ever do, right? Now, most of us, we are saved, we are born again, we are redeemed, we are going to heaven, but we might continue to ask ourselves, so what? After you get saved, what's next? What's next, folks, is to serve our Lord, right? And one day, if we serve our Lord on this earth, we can stand before the Lord at the judgment seat or beam of seat of Christ with confidence. And hopefully, folks, hopefully you'll be able to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant.